Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Daniel Benjamin, I'm the director of the Dickey Center, and I want to welcome you to this lecture by General James Mattis, this year's Class of 1950 Senior Foreign Affairs Fellow. And I'd like to begin by thanking the Class of 1950 for their great generosity in making this event possible. The Class of 1950 was the very first class that had John Sloan Dickey preside over their entire time at Dartmouth. And I know many of them were inspired uh, by him to lead lives engaged in world affairs. And uh, I particularly want to welcome members of the class who are here, uh, Doug Smith, Jim Strickler, David Taylor, Joe Mer uh, Medlicott, thank you so much for coming today. And I hope I haven't mangled any of your names. <laughs> Uh, I am really delighted uh, that Jim Mattis could join us at the Dickey Center for two weeks this fall. Over the course of a 41-year career that began when he was commissioned as a lieutenant, he has commanded platoons, companies, battalions, and divisions. Many of you may have read about General Mattis in the bestseller Generation Kill or in One Bullet Away, The Making of a Marine Officer by Dartmouth trustee and uh, Nate, Nate Fick, class of 99. And those are very good places to start to get a sense of his innovation as a military commander, his dedication to those he led in combat, and into his bravery. And if you see Nate Fick, ask him what it was like to slide into a forward fighting hole in the desert outside of Kandahar one freezing night and find then Brigadier General Jim Mattis leaning against sandbags checking up on a corporal and a sergeant. As uh, Nate wrote in his book, this was real leadership. It's safe to say, and I think that some of the attendees here uh, will confirm this, that there is no living Marine who's had a more distinguished career or an illustrious record than General Jim Mattis. And the reverence in which he is held in the US military is truly extraordinary. The capstone on his remarkable career was his service as the four-star combatant command, or as they say in the land of endless acronyms and abbreviations, the COCOM of Central Command. For those of you unfamiliar with the way uh, the military is organized, the COCOM is the senior commander of regions that are roughly as large as continents. As head of Central Command, which comprehends the busiest and most troubled of all regions of the world, General Mattis oversaw military operations in Afghanistan and Iraq, and relationships with 18 other countries ranging from Pakistan to Egypt. He commanded more than 200,000 men and women. At least as important as the Washington Post's Dana Priest wrote some years ago, commanders like General Mattis have become, in, in uh, her word, proconsuls, wielding enormous influence among the governments of the regions. Uh, in an era of resource-starved diplomacy, the COCOMs have become some of our most important emissaries, and they play a pivotal role in the policy process as well. More often than not, they have relationships with foreign leaders of a depth and a quality that are unsurpassed. On a personal note, I can say that in my time as the head of the Counterterrorism Bureau at the State Department, I couldn't have asked for a better colleague on the military side than General Mattis. And when it came to dealing with such hot spots and headaches as Pakistan and Yemen, he was the ideal partner, thoughtful, constructive, always energetic, and perhaps most amazingly at that level of the, uh, of the universe, a good listener. I'm incredibly pleased that he agreed to come to Dartmouth before taking up a position at Stanford Super Institution later this fall. And I want to thank him for making so many visits to so many classes, meetings with so many different student and faculty groups and individuals here at Dartmouth. The last three years have been arguably the most eventful in the history of the broader Middle East. And as we look across the region, we see a civil war and the worst humanitarian crisis in a generation in Syria, revolution and repression in Egypt, the prospect of a nuclear-armed Iran looming closer, an uncertain Iraq, and a major transformation in Afghanistan. So I can't think of anyone better to give a tour of the horizon, uh, a tormented horizon, I might add, than General James Mattis. He's told me he's going to give a comprehensive view of the region, and then afterwards we'll have plenty of time to drill down during questions and answers. It's my great pleasure to welcome General James Mattis.
Well, thanks very much, uh, Ambassador Dan, and thanks all of you for having me up here. Uh, something that glowing could only have been written if you conspired with my mother. I don't think anyone else would come up with something that nice. And it is a pleasure to be here at Dartmouth. It's been the rigor. Uh, it's been uh, the reputation of the Dartmouth faculty, of the Dartmouth student body that brought me here. I had many different offers, and I chose this one. Part of the reason is a sense of guilt, since 95% of Ambassador Dan's problems grew out of my region, that when he asked me, I kind of felt I had to put him at the... Uh, at the front of the line. Uh, it's also a privilege to be here because frankly, ladies and gentlemen, after some of my uh, publicized remarks, it's a pleasure and honor to be invited to any polite company to speak anymore. Uh, so thank you, uh, thanks very much. And I do have an affiliation with the class of 1950 as well. I was born that year. So thanks very much for having me here. Um, but, uh, I, but I do appreciate you all taking the time uh, to, to meet out of your schedules. Also, those of you out in virtual land, uh, this is streaming live, I understand, and even there to the, uh, where I was once on the faculty at the Naval Academy Prep School in Newport. They're watching. They're probably going to grade me on this, unfortunately, so I'm going to have to be alert to the potential that once again I could be in academic trouble as I was when I was your young ages. Um, I think, though, for those of us who've been modestly successful in our chosen line of work, we owe it to you to run the elevator back down, open the door, invite you on board, and say, these are the mistakes I made. We're no smarter than you. We have a little bit more confidence about what we can do in the world because you just haven't been there yet, but we certainly owe it to you to explain where we went right, where we went wrong, and we'll really get into some of that in the question and answer period where you can challenge me because during the tour of the horizon, as Ambassador put it, uh, this is a very contentious area. I've served out here since I sailed into these waters as an infantry company commander on a Navy amphibious ship in 1979. And that's before some of you were born, young lady. So I would just tell you that uh, to try and give you a tour of this very uh, tumultuous zone, it's in more upset than any time that I served out there it's going to be a, we're going to have to go a little lightly as I speak to it, hopefully give you enough to prime the pump, and then you come, come back at me here. And I'll talk just long enough, I think, to close the gap between you and I a little bit and speak about basically three things. Uh, the Middle East situation, certainly, and our enduring interests, and something I think, uh, sir, based on our discussion in the boys' room ahead of time, I want to convince you that we do have enduring interests out here that keep us locked on. Uh, our military's role in the Middle East, I mean, where does it fit into all this? Uh, perhaps some of you think, and, and there's certainly an argument to be made, that we've over-militarized our foreign policy. So where does the military fit? What's its proper role? And certainly I want to talk about our military itself in the face of reduced budgets. And then we'll open it up to whatever's on your, on your minds. Uh, go wherever you want to take it. First, the situation. One person I said sir to, in Washington about two years ago had called me in and he, his, his, uh, the way he put it was, what in the heck is going on in your region? As if I was responsible for it. Um, so it, it is quite a, quite a place. The Mideast as we know it today though, one of the challenges we face is some people became aware of it intellectually at a certain point. And the Middle East did not start with the Arab Spring. Okay, you all say we understand that. But it didn't start with 9-11 either. And it also didn't start with the birth of the modern state of Israel. It didn't start uh, with the colonial era. It goes back, I'll give you an example, the Sunni and Shia tensions you see violently displayed in Syria today are what, 13, 1400 years old right now. Uh, so as the more you uh, narrow your understanding of the situation, the less understanding you will have of the situation. And it is a very, very complex uh, region. So let me start with a quick tour uh, just to remind ourselves of the extent of some of the challenges. I won't even be able to hit them all. Um, if I took the entire time, no question and answer, I still couldn't cover it all. So some of you will come back at me and say, why didn't you, and I'll, I'll address it if it's at, that's your interest. Starting with Libya, Gaddafi's gone. Gaddafi's long gone. And yet the uh, political Islam, the jihadists, are still running around. There's no reconciliation between them. Uh, it's had a very rocky start on its 
on its uh, route toward democracy, if in fact that where it goes. Uh, Egypt, Egypt is absolutely critical. A third of the Arab peoples live in Egypt and where Egypt goes with the Arab Spring, you watch them as a barometer. That's probably going to tell you where the Arab Spring is going to go across the region. It's that critical a country. There are a lot of reasons for that, and more than just population and demographics. But they're experiencing right now a very long and winding road toward democracy. They're in the midst of a setback, and the sooner they get back onto a democratic election schedule, the better. But it's unsurprising that they would take some time. There's a lot of people who say it took us probably about 60 years to get our democracy on the right road, and we're still working on it right now. So the idea that somehow after a long, long winter, if this is an Arab Spring, it was going to be over in six months or in the first election, I think that was highly unrealistic, and I'll touch on that in just a moment. But the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, they lost any kind of confidence for their, because of economic and political mistakes. The largest mass demonstrations probably in the world, millions of people in the street as a result, and at that point the military muscled the Muslim Brothers out. I think there was never any love lost there anyway. And right now you see the situation as it lies. Lebanon, uh, the Cedar Revolution there was stillborn. Uh, the Iranians, uh, Lebanese Hezbollah killed Prime Minister Harari some years ago, uh, and they did that with Syria's help. And now you've got Syria's bloody civil war going on right next door and these refugees pouring over the border. And you can imagine what that's doing to any kind of stability in that tiny country squeezed between Israel on the south, Turkey on the north. It's a very, uh, or to the north of Syria there. So it's a very, very difficult situation. Uh, and it is, it is probably as precarious now as it has been in the last 15 years. And you all know what happened to Lebanon before, once known as the Switzerland of the Middle East, and most of us, even of my age in this room, now remember it as a place torn apart by civil war. You actually see something of value come out of a situation as bloody awful as their civil war, ladies and gentlemen. It's almost like an inoculation. We're not Lebanese Hezbollah, not the Sunni, not the Christians, not the Druze. Nobody wants to go back to that right now because they saw how horrible it was. So there's a little bit of a moderator, a little bit of a governor on the hate engine in Lebanon, but it's, uh, it's a pretty thin veneer right now and it could get scraped through by what's going on in Syria next door. Talk about Syria for a minute. It's at the geopolitical heart of the Middle East. Uh, it's destabilizing the entire region and it's good to remember how this starts, this current civil war starts, because Assad and his regime were ready for this. This was not a surprise. They were completely ready to fight this kind of a war. And the people come out in the streets, they're demonstrating, they're fed up, and they get shot down. And to the everlasting credit, they go out day after day, unarmed, demonstrating, and get shot, shot down until finally they've had enough, and now they recoil violently and you see what's happened is this magnet of violence has drawn in all sorts of people uh, to, uh, into the uh, fray. The savagery is increasing. I met with uh, refugees on two occasions up on the Jordanian border. And ladies and gentlemen, I've dealt with refugees on the Dalmatian coast in Kosovo, Bosnia, in Southeast Asia, boat people and fished them out of the water. I've seen them in Africa. I have never seen refugees as traumatized at what's coming out of Syria right now. Uh, it, it is worse than BBC or CNN or Al Jazeera can show you. So it's, uh, it's a war. It's been enabled by Russia's <coughs> regrettable veto in the United Nations. And the only way Assad has stayed in power is because the Iranians have kept him there with fighters, weapons, uh, money, ammunition, everything he needs, full-throated support. It's been Iranian support that has kept Assad in power. In regards to Iran, and some of you are probably going to want to ask more questions about Iran uh, afterwards, I'll, I will touch on it. Uh, it is, uh, there is some opportunity right now. We've seen it develop with, uh, with President Rouhani, who's come in replacing Ahmadinejad. The guy we used to joke about calling him I'm a dinner jacket, actually, is a little bit of a nutcase, but he was a pragmatic fellow, too, in his own way. 
uh, he was a danger, and I'm not sure how much freedom President Rouhani, who was allowed to run, as you know, by the Supreme Leader, how much freedom he has to maneuver diplomatically. He is not a reformist himself. People are saying is, I don't believe he is. He was elected with the reformist vote, and certainly we should engage. I, I'm absolutely convinced we should diplomatically engage, but I would have very modest expectations. I don't know that the internal dynamics in Tehran will permit him the freedom he needs, even if he was convinced this was the right way to go to diplomatically solve the uh, situation Iran has gotten itself into. I'm not sure he'd be given the freedom to go that direction. Uh, they are, the Iranians are fomenting, uh, I would call it mayhem and mischief across the region, but even beyond, uh, from Thailand to Bulgaria. Uh, believe it or not, I've seen the intelligence. I thought not even the Iranians would be dumb enough to try to set off a bomb in Washington, D.C. In fact, but for one mistake, uh, they would have succeeded in killing the Saudi ambassador less than two miles from the White House. They made one fundamental mistake. It was not a rogue intelligence agent who did this. It was decided at the highest levels in Tehran, and they decided they would kill an ambassador. Now, ambassadors are men and women of peace, but it's a, it's a reminder of just how uh, roughshod this country can be when it comes to international norms, uh, that, they that they would even consider uh, doing something like that. And considering that restaurant would have been full of Americans, uh, they were unconcerned with the, uh, with the potential collateral damage of, of even their, uh, their, their primary target going down and a lot of other innocent people being killed. But if Assad falls, that'll be the biggest strategic setback for Iran in the last 25 years. So you can understand why they are fully supporting Assad and why they're not going to pull back Economic sanctions will not stop them. Uh, this, is, this is going to be a very challenging situation. And from our perspective, we, and talking to our friends and allies and partners and, and all out there, more about them later, uh, Iran must not be allowed to dominate this region, must not. The Turks aren't going to stand for it. The Saudis aren't, the Israelis aren't. This, this would lead to a very difficult situation and right now, as Henry Kissinger has pointed out, Iran is acting like a revolutionary cause, not like a nation. In other words, we're dealing with Iran as if it's a nation, but it's acting like a revolutionary cause, defending the Shia, whatever they can do in order to try to keep their unpopular government with the, the support of the people. And so long as they do that, they're going to do dumb things. Uh, for example, they're going to say that, well, we have enemies in Turkey and Saudi, so we need, uh, maybe that's why they say they need a nuclear weapon, I don't know, in their private discussion. The problem is if they develop a nuclear weapon, then they're going to have two countries that don't like them right now, but don't have nukes, and those two countries will get nukes. I guarantee you, if Iran gets a nuke, Saudi and Turkey will get nukes. They're not going to stay unarmed. So proliferation will go on, and now Iran will be in worse shape because they'll have enemies out there, uh, adversaries who are nuclear armed. So they're actually doing things that are not, that is not even logical uh, in, this, in this regard. Let me jump down to Yemen, very unusual little country, impoverished, uh, millions of refugees from the Horn of Africa and the drought-stricken areas there, Somalia, uh, those kinds of areas. Uh, and yet there, the Arab Spring protests against a, a president, I guess for life, because he'd been there for 30-odd years, Saleh, they were successful in forcing him out with no small thanks to a group of ambassadors from unlikely partners, United States, France, Britain, Russia, working together and the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council. And President Hadi is in there now and somehow they've had an election, he's in. Now the problem for Yemen besides its economic situation, the refugee situation is Al Qaeda and the Iranians are both pouring in weapons and, and money and that sort of thing to try to stabilize him. So President Hadi has his hands full. But a surprising, I think a very surprising success story out of the Arab Spring where skeptics in many cases saying, oh, it's all bad, it's all, all horrible. Well, it's not all horrible. Uh, there's been more change, for example, uh, in Yemen, uh, thanks to the Arab Spring, than all of Al-Qaeda's murders have ever led to. 
So they're also seeing, the people in the region, that there are political ways to change what's going on. You don't have to go to using the bomb. <coughs> Pakistan, uh, it's got a radicalizing society in a country, I think it was a country, of course it was born out of the very bloody partition, uh, but it was a country, ladies and gentlemen, that was born with very little affection for itself. And as a result, it's been hard for them to really come together as a country. They're, they're in such strong factions uh, there in that country. They have the fastest growing nuclear arsenal in the world. Uh, their economy's in tatters. They're either unable or unwilling to remove the terrorist safe ha havens there along the border. And in that war, by the way, uh, this is arithmetic, you can have whatever opinion you wish of Pakistan, but the Pakistan army has lost more troops fighting the terrorists in that area than all of, U of NATO combined, including the United States. So it's a very, again, it's a very complex issue. It's a federally administered tribal area. Uh, in other words, it's not a place where they have full sovereignty over it, and obviously they've been unable to maintain sovereignty over it. In Afghanistan next door, uh, we're seeing fi almost 15, I think we're at 48 nations right now, the French polled and, and some others, uh, one other. But right now, the largest wartime coalition in recent modern history, uh, largest wartime coalition in the world's history is fighting right now alongside each other. Sometimes when I used to go up to testify in front of the House or the Senate, I used to wish that we could put the 50 flags on the bridge going into Washington so they could all see it's not just Americans. Three countries have lost more boys per capita than our country has in this fight, three of the NATO nations. So I would just tell you that uh, we're going to continue our strategy there, protecting the people as best we can against an enemy that, uh, that is uh, apocalyptically open and who is a legitimate target men, women, children, old men, whatever, uh, they go after all of them. Uh, we're going to try and protect them while we're, we're mentoring the Afghan army to stand up. Right now, we are seldom even patrolling anymore. There's a reason why our casualties have plummeted. The Afghan army's casualties are higher, uh, at, but they are fighting the Taliban. They are winning against the Taliban, and the Taliban know they can't win at the ballot box. That's why they refuse to go into the democratic process. Secretary Clinton was very clear if they ceased using violence, if they said they would live by the Constitution and, and deal with it politically, and if they would break with Al-Qaeda, just those three things, they were welcome to come into the political process. They know what awaits them if they come into the political process, so they say, no, we'll stick with bombs. When you get two irreconcilable wills like that, the only thing you can do is fight them. And so the fighting now is almost all Afghan military, Afghan police doing the fighting. We'll be there for yet another year in our training and mentoring role, and at some point, all of our combat troops will come out and we'll leave only trainers and mentors there under the NATO command. Uh, we have made some real progress. Probably one of the most challenging things I tried to explain when I was giving testimony was how could you have progress and violence coexist? The violence is so, so disheartening when it's women and children being killed. Uh, it's, it, you say, how, how can you say there's progress? We just had another school bombed or something. And that's, that's, that's understandable, that, e that emotion, that, that psychological effect uh, is real. Uh, but at the same time, just the fact that there's girls going to school when the Taliban was there, there were not any. The Taliban were keenly aware of what education does for people and would not permit girls to go to school. The, the fact that this, this is going on, that the education is going on, is going to work in the long run to do what no soldier or Marine with an M16 can do, and that's go to the root causes of this ignorance that allows this, what happened on 9-11, to take root uh, there in that area. Uh, let me just touch on Iraq for a minute. Uh, I wasn't even going to touch on Iraq, and I thought I'd add it. You know, I was watching, you know, obviously in my headquarters, I'm traveling around the region. I was watching as the Arab Spring broke out. Did you notice there was one capital that didn't have big crowds demonstrating and demanding uh, a voice in their government? Yeah. yeah, it was Iraq and Baghdad. There weren't any. And I wondered why, 
could it be that there they thought they had some voice? Imperfect, no history of democracy, an imperfect democracy, and yet, ladies and gentlemen, the Sunnis and the Kurds at times get together to try to offset the Prime Minister Shia Maliki's uh, policies, and all. it's not perfect, it doesn't look like Switzerland, but the different groups are still trying to settle their issues politically. At the same time, Al-Qaeda has redoubled its efforts to murder innocent people, really going after the Shia and trying to, uh, trying to destroy them, any kind of sense of collaboration across uh, these, uh, these sectarian lines. And the Al-Qaeda, for all those who say that we've <coughs> beaten them or they've had some real bad blows, that's true. Uh, there's a lot of Al-Qaeda leaders, ladies and gentlemen, who are not going to collect their 401k programs, okay? That's a fact. Uh, but the franchise, the philosophy continues, it lives on, and when you run into this, this level of hatred, don't think it's going to be over quickly. I'm from the American West, and the worst forest fires in our history out there were those where you pulled the fire crews off the fire line early and they broke back out. So you have to be very careful about declaring victory. It's not going to be like on the deck of a battleship Missouri in Tokyo Harbor or something like this. It's not going to be like that. If I was to give you a model, look at the U.S. Army and the American Plains Indians, 1850 to 1905, and the constant skirmishing that goes on there. We are going to be continuing this skirmish uh, back and forth, and we're going to have to make some decisions within our own country what level of risk are we willing to live with? What level of constitutional rights and civil rights do we want to surrender? What level are we unwilling to surrender, even if it means once in a while an enemy gets through? And if, that, if we make that decision, let's make sure we don't then look at the guy in the White House and say, it's all your fault. I mean, that we, we have to live with our decisions, but this reality that Iraq is dealing with shows you that it can resurface even after it's been beaten down and the Iraqi people have a pretty good police force right now, pretty good army, and it's got its hands full trying to keep this under control. Talk about the Arab Spring for a moment here. Uh, we have to be careful because we like living in a democracy here in this country of assuming, well, that must be what is good for everybody. There are millions and millions of Arabs who want to live in democracy. They believe that's the best form of government to give them what they're looking for. Millions of them. But there are also many people there who see democracy as majority rule, everybody else loses. Well, that's not what democracy is, and there's a lot of decisions to be made. If you were to take Cairo 2011 and replace for the crowds in the streets the same motiv the motivations of Paris 1789, you might find echoing across the centuries the same human yearnings that people are not rushing perhaps pell-mell to democracy, remember what came out of the revolution, Napoleon, things like that, but they were fleeing from unjust, unresponsive governments. And in this regard, you, you've got to be very careful to think that every decision is somehow going to track neatly towards democracy, that every obstacle will be overcome uh, in, in a couple hours with time out for commercials. I wouldn't exaggerate what happens when you get a setback. I would call what happened right now in Egypt a setback. I think the military leaders would call it a setback. I think in their own way, they wanted to keep the love of the Egyptian people. They're very highly thought of in the country. They refused during the big riots, you remember, to fire on their people. And I think they did not want to get into this thing. But at the same time, they see themselves, the military, as the protectors of the Egyptian character. And when the Muslim brothers did what they did, we see this setback. I would be honest, I would call it a setback, but I would not overreact and say that the military is not out to try and get those elections going again. They have their own internal, own internal interests to push them in that direction. Uh, let me talk for a minute about our interests there in, in the region. Uh, first of all, uh, we have friends, we have partners, we have allies out there that have stood by us, uh, Arab and Israeli, and we need to stand with them in tough times uh, because it's in our interest because one of these days we're going to need them. Uh, I'll give you the example of United Arab Emirates. 
United Arab Emirates has stood with us uh, going all the way back to Desert Shield, Desert Storm. They stood by us then, they fought alongside us. When we went into Kosovo, Bosnia, United Arab Emirates were there. When we went into uh, Somalia, the Emirates were there with their military. When we went into Libya, they joined the NATO campaign there along with Qatar and Jordan and they supported the NATO effort, United Nations sanctioned, sort of, uh, going to dump Gaddafi out. Uh, in Afghanistan, they have stood by us. In fact, as some of our traditional allies have pulled their troops out or started reducing, they have added fighter aircraft and special forces to take up the slack, so I didn't have to, as CENTCOM commander, go back to the U.S. Army, the U.S. Marine Corps, and say, by the way, I need more people coming in here. They actually picked up the slack. Another, another ally, uh, a guy I call your majesty when I, when I would be meeting with him, he, we were done talking one day and, he, and uh, we were just shooting the breeze about democracy and what he was up to and, and that sort of thing. And he, I, and he said, you know, I want you to know, he said, that we'll be with you in Afghanistan until the last American soldier goes home to America. Now, you can't buy allies like that. So when you look at our enduring interests in the Middle East, Certainly our allies, our partners, our, our friends out there who have stood with us are very, very important and increasingly so. So friends, partners, allies, there's one reason. Economic interests. Now, we all know that probably between Mexico, Canada, and the United States, we will be close to energy independence, as close as you can te probably technically be. I don't know, 2019, somewhere around there. People say, well, doesn't that mean we can turn our back on the Middle East? Oil is a globally com traded commodity. So the price at the pump for oil will still continue to be set where most of it comes out of the ground, and that's the Middle East. The rest of the world's economies uh, are too fragile right now, and our own included, to take the, the, uh, the disruption of the free flow of commerce coming out of the Middle East. The Crown Prince of the United Arab Emirates, Mohammed bin Zayed, said, look, if the world's economy depends on oil, then it's an international responsibility to try to keep stability in the Middle East. So we have our friends and our allies and our partners who've been standing with us. We've got the economic interest. And the third one, of course, is the violent extremists. Um, we, we, we're going to have to stand united. No country can stand alone in this globalized world. We don't need another 9-11. We don't need another 7-7 in London or what happened in Madrid. Uh, we've seen the bombs go off in Egypt, killing uh, Egyptian police and soldiers, uh, and the internecine fights that are going on in places. This cannot be handled by any one country, and the country with the most aircraft carriers does not necessarily have all the right answers. We're going to have to listen to others, we're going to have to work with others, and get law enforcement and, and militaries to work together. So those are what I believe are the three anchors we have in the Middle East. What's the framework within which I operated? I had about 200,000 troops uh, in CENTCOM, ships, soldiers, sailors, airmen, coast guardsmen, marines. What did I do with them? How did I work them? Uh, the, I worked very closely with State Department, and State Department gave me four basic fr framing principles. Uh, we, the, America is going to help support the political reform in countries that need it at their own pace at their own pace. Uh, another framing principle is we want economic reforms that spread the fruits of what's coming out of over there so that more people feel ownership of their country like they have a promise for a future. They deserve that. We're going to support them uh, when it comes to a re-energized Middle East peace process. The problem, do the protagonists want peace as much as we do? And therein lies the rub but we should not pass this problem to the next generation. We've lived with it, us old guys with gray hair our entire lives, and we, this is something that's got to be addressed, and the chances for a two-state solution supported by Republican and Democrat administrations for many, many years are actually going backwards right now. We can get into more of that in the Q&A if you want. And the last point, and this is where I actually had the lead and, and State Department deferred to me, guided me, but deferred to me on much of it, and that was how do we protect the territorial integrity 
and against uh, any country that would, there's only one, Iran, that would choose to uh, go after some of the others and help work with them against terrorists. So those are the frameworks within, the, the foreign policy frameworks within which I operated and why I worked so closely with, uh, with Ambassador Dan here. In all of this, Iran remains the single most destabilizing influence in the area. Uh, but I would tell you, too, that uh, Iran probably will remain, even if Assad leaves power, ladies and gentlemen, Iran will still remain probably the near-term uh, danger. And somehow we've got to find a way for them to start acting like a country and we can perhaps deal with their legitimate security interests so they don't have to do illegitimate things uh, like setting off bombs in Washington, D.C. or in Bulgaria or, or, uh, or cr making a nuclear weapon. I'm going to shift gears now for just a couple minutes and talk about the military's role uh, in a few more particulars. With the drawdown in Afghanistan and our pullout from Iraq, uh, this is an increasingly naval theater. We're going back kind of to the future. Back in the 1940s, 50s, we kept a few ships out there. We probably will need more ships to reassure our friends, but it will become a more naval, a, a more naval theater as far as the American military role. The role itself is to maintain a military presence in the Middle East. Professor Jennifer Lind here at Dartmouth, writing about another theater, the Pacific, has written uh, that friends have got to see us. They, they have to know we will be there. And I would just point out that after 40-odd years of wearing a uniform for our country, you cannot surge trust. You can't surge it. Now, there are some people who enjoy, who have a, who have a, a uh, they, they are inclined to distrust. And don't worry about them. There's, those people exist everywhere. They enjoy their, their life, I guess. But most things that happen that are good in this world are done on faith and trust. And we have got a level of trust out there, despite what have been, I think, by any measure, some significant mistakes. Uh, our willingness to call, call out our mistakes, to, to admit them, uh, has strengthened us enormously. And if you can't surge trust and you think you may have to fight together, because the only way to deter a war is to be ready to fight it, at least one of the primary ways in my line of work, then you have to be able to work together from day one. How many of you would like to watch the Super Bowl game if the team didn't get together until they got in the locker room just before they got on the playing field? I mean, it looked like a bunch of bozos out there. Now, we're serious enough about our football to recognize you've got to work together and train together and rehearse together if you're ever going to play in the Super Bowl. When you're in a role where you're going to sign orders sending young men and women into a fight, you want to make certain you set them up to fight well. So we're going to have to be out there. We're going to have to have a presence out there if, in fact, these enduring anchors, these interests, mean that we have an interest in preventing war. And we can do that. We can have that effect. Uh, the, some of the biggest skeptics to this, by the way, I address, are in America. Out in the region, many fewer skeptics. Certainly, we could say that among our friends and all, but even among some of the people I dealt with that were clearly adversarial, even they admitted that we had a stabilizing presence. And so, on the one hand, if you want to reassure your friends and you want to temper your allies, your adversaries' designs, then you're going to have to be present. You can't just say, well, we could come if there's trouble. Uh, so we maintain our own presence. We have to enhance our allies. There is no reason the American military and the American taxpayer should continue to carry the heaviest burden. We're going to have to allow them to do what they want to do and work with them to do it. We cannot continue to go to the people in this country and say we're going to take money from health care, from education, from infrastructure. You know, the, the patience level and the lack of political unity in our own country on this issue is such that we simply have got to accept we can't do it on our own. We must work with others. Uh, I think that uh, if we do this, maintain a presence, we, we help our, our friends out there and promote regional stability, it's also to ensure the free flow of commerce, of course. Uh, you could say, well, what about the fighting in Syria? Of course we want the fighting in Syria to end, and there's things we can do about that, but not a whole lot at times. 
And I, I suggest to you that America has no moral imperative to do the impossible. I mean, as dis upsetting as it is, as distressing as it is, and again, I've met with these refugees, just have to be very, very careful about giving yourself mission impossible. How does the military do it? I hope there's some skeptics in the room here about what the military can do to provide stability. A couple years ago, remember when uh, Iran, you kept hearing we're going to mine the Straits of Hormuz? Remember it was, it was in the news constantly, it was daily. It was on the TV. So I was sitting in the back of a plane one day, I said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to have a counter, international counter mining, mine clearing exercise. Not an anti-Iran exercise, an anti-mine exercise. So we put the word out, in my fifth fleet, my Navy element went to work on it, good sailors. And I thought maybe we'd get a dozen countries, you know, France, Britain, Italy, you know, the NATO countries, maybe a couple others. We ended up with 29 nations in the first one, 29 nations from five continents, it included Canada, Estonia, Japan, Singapore, Djibouti, not necessarily bellicose nations. They weren't anti-Iran. They were just telling whatever nation wanted to put mines in the water, here were 29 nations in an exercise going to do it. And Iran, in Tehran, in the regime, they suddenly realized they were creating their own international community against them with this kind of talk. Since then, we've run one more of these exercises to remind them, had even more countries show up, 35 the next time. We have not heard, how many, how many of you have heard about them threatening to mine the Straits lately? Pretty quiet on it. There are ways for military forces to be used ethically and morally in a stabilizing role. And if we don't do that, as expensive as the exercise is, it's still expensive to steam ships out there and bring everybody together. Uh, what would be a lot more expensive is somebody dropping mines in the water, shutting down the oil that certain countries need from China to Japan, from Europe uh, to, to other areas, and then have to deal with that situation. I would tell you, too, that uh, we made other offers at that time to include having direct communications on mill-to-mill -mill levels to see if they wanted to reduce uh, any kind of anxieties or, or potential for miscalculation. They turned that down. Uh, it's a regime truly at war within itself. I was at the, the Manama Dialogues when our Secretary of State two years ago, three years ago now, was there, and she ran into the Foreign Minister of Iran. A uh, big crowded room, uh, looked like something out of Hollywood Central Casting, people with all sorts of robes on and uniforms, fancy glittering things, anything guys can wear to impress the girls, you know what I mean? Yeah. And we were, she turned around, she happened to be right next to her and said, well, foreign minister, so good to see you, and put her hand out. And like a petulant little schoolboy, turned around and walked off. And immediately it showed where they're at on this thing. I mean, you, you can say anything you want about whether or not our policies have been great, but the offers have been made and continue to be made to try and sort this out somewhat uh, short of the, uh, the old-fashioned uh, ugly way. Let me talk, shift one last uh, subject here about your military. It's a national treasure as far as I'm concerned. I'm still amazed the Marine Corps allowed me to stay in its ranks and serve alongside those young sailors and Marines so long. But it's, uh, it's a military very much uh, defined by ethical performance in the grimmest circumstances. Uh, young men and women, young patriots, who looked far beyond the hot political rhetoric, uh, all volunteers, uh, a very poorly explained war, and yet they've continued to come in. They've seen the war. This isn't something they're unaware of. They've grown up with it. They've seen CNN. They've seen the wounded, the photos of, of casualties and that sort of thing. And yet uh, they, they certainly, uh, fighting alongside these, these very uh, self-deprecating, very high-spirited young folks has been an absolute uh, privilege, humbling privilege all along. And they kept a wonderful sense of humor. I remember on one occasion I'm walking down the street in Ramadi, a very hot day, extraordinarily hot, over 120 degrees. And it's one of those terrible days. Our boys are shooting down the street, and they're shooting back down the street at us. And I walked up behind the young 19-year-old corporal, uh, and I said, uh, I asked him the single most inane question ever asked of a corporal in combat in the illustrious 235 years of history of the Marine Corps. 
I said, hey guys, what's going on? <laughs> and I think convinced that some village had lost its idiot, he dropped his rifle for a minute. He said, well, General, we're just taking the fun out of fundamentalism over here. <laughs> and I, I give you this because don't underestimate the level of stress that young man was under right then as he took his infantry boys against them. But I bring it up because someone who's keeping his sense of cool like that is going to keep his ethical sense too. He's still in touch with reality. He's not, he's not losing it. And that's what represents them. Now, every so often, we've had disappointments. We've had court martials. We've had people thrown in jail because we hold ourselves accountable. But for those people who think that the bad guys, the few bad incidents, represent what hundreds of thousands of troops have been doing. That is objectively false. And I would just remind you that Jesus of Nazareth had one out of 12 go to crap on him. So you don't, don't take the one out of, uh, out of the thousand that went and did something bad here as defining or representing your beautiful military. Now, the budget realities mean that we are going to do less with a smaller military. That's not necessarily bad. They're, they're, that's, that's not a, a bad thing, that's a choice. But then I hope that the people who are supporting that choice will also recognize that when they get offended by someone's criminal activity somewhere, we may not have the strength to just say, well, let's just rotate our soldiers back out there. They've been home two months. Let's send them out for another year. In other words, we're going to do less. But here's the message to our enemies, and I made it very clear on Capitol Hill when I know my testimony is recorded and all. We are going to do less with our military. We will not do it less well. If the president orders us into action, it will be our adversary's longest day, and it will be their worst day. And that's the way it's going to be. They're going to find that free men and women can fight like the Dickens if we get pressed. Uh, I think that what we do with this military and looking forward on a strategic level, we try to create a military that's agile so we have the fewest regrets when the big surprises hit, whether it be a Pearl Harbor or whatever it is, we want to have a military that from the time the surprise hits till we take effective action is very short time. So you don't want to create a military that's only made for one kind of warfare, like only in counterinsurgency. It must be able to fight across the board because at this point in your young lives, for you students, uh, fate has given you America in a role that you will help shape, but you cannot completely abrogate it uh, and still be the hope that many, many people in the world, including across the Mideast, want it to be. So our military presence in the region, it is evolving to primarily naval, but our interests and our relations and our partners, uh, th those are enduring. Those are going to continue. And there's big strategic questions we need you to answer. And you look at John Sloan Dickey's challenge that, hey, these aren't impossible problems. These problems can be solved as long as we have people who do, do the rigorous research. Strategic questions, how much engagement do the American people want? I don't know. I'm not in the Marine Corps. I wasn't in the Marine Corps. I was in the U.S. Marine Corps. We answer to you. You tell us what you want. You run that by who you send to Washington. How much should we commit? I'll tell you right now, there's a perceived lack of commitment by the Americans in the region. And if that's in Riyadh and Tel Aviv and everywhere else out there, that in itself can be destabilizing as much as you and I may say, I'd rather stay in the New Hampshire woods, go on a hike, and hit the library at night. That's a lot better way to live your life. You can't shut out the rest of the world. And we saw that on 9-11, I think, pretty, uh, pretty effectively brought home to us. A big question I would have is political Islam as practiced by the Muslim brothers in Cairo as practiced by the mullahs in Tehran, is that in our best interest? If not, what's our strategy to deal with it? The larger question, Lord Robertson uh, of the UK recently summed up, I think he said, do we today have the farsightedness and the boldness to look at today's threats and come up with the vision and leadership that brought us through past threats? And his view, and I agree with him, is I believe we do have the capacity, but we're failing to carry it out. And I'm looking directly at my generation right now. And for you in the younger generation, unburdened by 43 years, unburdened by 30-odd years in the Middle East, we need uh, your mission to pick this up in John Sloan Dickey's uh, challenge uh, and come up with solutions. Let me stop there because I want to leave time for questions, okay?
Go ahead. You did good because the ambassador was going to ask the first question, you beat him, and I like that kind of initiative. That's great. Look, Putin's living in the past, he, uh, but he's frozen in it. Uh, as a Russian friend of mine put it, he's stuck on stupid. Um, and, and he is still a Cold War warrior. That's not to dismiss him. He, he is the leader of a, of a still powerful country, but one whose demographics are going to force Russia to get closer to Europe or not do that, and NATO, or not do that, and watch his country continue to slide backwards. So he is on a no-win path right now. Even Chancellor Merkel, who put, moved heaven and earth to try to keep some kind of collaboration with the Russians long after they had probably worn out their welcome everywhere else, even she has now said, this guy, you know, you just can't work with him. And when she loses her patience, I think that's the canary in the mind shaft. We're just going to have to see what we can do to work with them in the future when the reality comes home to roost. Good enough. I got passed over to the ambassador here. <laughs> Civilian control of the military. Okay. <laughs> well, I just wanted to put one or two question, follow-up questions to you. Uh, and I want to thank you, first of all, for uh, a great presentation. You gave us more than enough to uh, work on for the next uh, few, few years, not to say a few minutes. I'm asking you this one because you speak to a lot of the leaders in the region and have a, have a view that I think very, very few will have. When we look at the Arab Spring, and I share your long-term <clears throat> optimism, one of the things that's striking is it seems as if uh, some pro-democracy demonstrators you know, set off a small explosion mm -hmm. um, and, um, and the world rallied and, and got very excited. But what we saw happen then was that in the small fissure in the pothole that was created by that, a volcano erupted of sectarian hatred. And um, when we look at Syria, you know, this is, it seems to many observers, the big showdown between Sunni and Shia that they've been certainly waiting for since uh, uh, the Iranian Revolution and, and possibly a lot longer. When you talk to these leaders, is, do you get a sense that there is an off-ramp, that this is going to stop somewhere, or is it not going to stop certainly before there's a change of power in Syria and the Sunnis come to power, or, or you know, what? Is there a sense of realism? I mean, for a while, we thought Bahrain was going to be the place where the world came to the end, again, because of yes. Sunni-Shia uh, tensions. But um, I'd, like, uh, I'd like your view on that. Well, Iran has been throwing gasoline on the fire of this, and the most thoughtful people I dealt with in the region uh, including ones who were very, very mature in their understanding of the history of this, say this is something they wanted to leave lie. It scares them all if this Sunni-Shia hatred comes out and gains traction. Uh, they realize that this is something that's very hard to restrain once it begins, and they are very, very pessimistic right now. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've seen someone sell out their country for $600 worth of beer and party favors for their daughter's sweet 16 birthday. That's pretty low level, okay? I have never seen someone sell out their religion. And I would just tell you that to many of the people who start thinking like this, once they drink from this cup, this poison <coughs> cup, it is very hard for them to understand the humanity that crosses any lines. They draw very narrowly who is, uh, who's okay and who's beyond the pale. Uh, I'm afraid in this case it may depend more on exhaustion. Okay, well, um, <clears throat> one more question that I'll put to you and then we'll open it up to the, uh, to the audience. Um, Pakistan, you had some depressing words about Pakistan. You and I shared a lot of mm -hmm. depressing exchanges about our relationship with Pakistan and where it was going. And there were times when we felt like Pakistan, the U.S. relationship with Pakistan was the elevator that had no bottom floor. Um, 
will our withdrawal from <clears throat> Afghanistan lead the Pakistanis to play a more constructive role with Afghanistan? Are they going to see it in their interest to build stability there? Uh, the relationship that we have with Pakistan has been conducted so much through military channels yeah. because of the uh, because of the strength of the Pakistani military, I think you'll have a unique insight into that. Yeah, you know, even during the worst days when you would hear that we were frozen, that we weren't talking with each other, any of those days I could push a button and talk to the chief of the Pakistan army. He would take the call. It were, they were non-adversarial, non-antagonistic discussions, that sort of thing. Uh, I think that as we draw down, there will be less, fewer opportunities for the military to military chain to work that issue. But if we can get, <coughs> excuse me, if we can get India and Pakistan to start opening uh, some economic relations, start with some social exchanges, there may be a way for Pakistan to sense they don't have to be as worried about their back door as they confront Big India in the front door. I think we're going to have to work that issue and watch, and right now there's some reason for optimism there between India and Pakistan. At the same time, I think, I hope we learned a lesson to never again cut off a country's officers from coming to our schools. We'd had a senator, by his name is Pressler, and Senator Pressler decided that because Pakistan, he didn't like Pakistan, we wouldn't allow their officers to come to our schools. After 9-11, I was sent in to work with the Pakistanis in order to get freedom to fly in. We needed to fly over their country in order to get into Afghanistan. All the generals who were talking to me, I was a one star, they were all two, three, four stars. <clears throat> they all told me the best year of their life was at Leavenworth, Kansas. Best year of their life was at at uh, Maxwell Air Force Base in Alabama. They'd come over on exchange tours. They'd gone to our schools. And then around the wall were their aides, majors and lieutenant colonels. And if looks could have killed, as these generals smiled and we found some, some common ground where it was not based on strangers or something. We actually knew each other. And up against the wall were these young officers and if looks could have killed, they'd have killed me because they were not allowed to come to America, and so we had forced them away. Well, who do you think is going to influence them if we force them away? I'll guarantee you one thing, it's not us. So we need to bring more of their students to our schools. We need to send more of our officers and our students to theirs. Very hard, I realize, to do the, the, the latter because it's not a safe area, but there's a way to keep this together. Okay. Well, there are a lot of questions, I know, so why don't I uh, yield the microphone. It is uh, essential that you have the microphone uh, when you answer a question. And please make sure that there's a question mark at the end of the question. Right over here. Hello, and thank you. Uh, my name is Carlos Santos Coy. I work on campus in um, basically diversity programs and leadership programs. Mm -hmm. And you've alluded to it. Uh, what, what I'm going to ask about in, in many ways, but maybe a little more directly, what role has cultural competence played in your experience and in your development as a leader? And then if you can turn that and what cultural competence development opportunities would you recommend for obviously young uh, up and coming military uh, as well as just student leaders all the way around? Yeah, great question. It's critical that you understand where they're at. They don't expect you to act like them. They don't expect you to be them. They do like to be understood. Uh, as soon as I'd get an expert come into my office and say, I'm gonna tell you about the Middle East. I mean, the Middle East is, is 30 things, you know, 30 different countries, you know, whatever. Uh, you know, I knew right away it was gonna be, be something not worth listening to, and I'd get people in there like that. At the level I was at, it was personal relations more than anything else that worked. And some of us had known each other since we were young officers uh, laughing, going to a place to have dinner to, one night because they wanted to show me what it was like to eat goat and yogurt, you know, and that sort of thing. So I'd sit there and we, neither one of us knew that 25 years later he'd be the chief of defense of his country and I'd be the CENTCOM commander. And now when I walk in and say, we got a problem in Libya, I need your Air Force to help fly with NATO, I was able to start from something. I'd say what you do is you travel as much as you can you try to live with uh, the folks, you know, not, not just go to the four-star hotel, but actually live amongst them. 
language skills are very important, but more and more people over in that, my region speak English now, so I mean, I was, I was given a buy on that, frankly. I think that would be uh, a poor excuse not to have foreign languages prioritized. But travel, foreign language, do a lot of reading about their history. Most of these countries have very rich histories, and they're very proud of them. And when I walk in and I start with something that it has to do with something they're proud of, again, we, you know, they call it drinking three cups of tea, but it's closer to 18 cups of tea and have a nice long talk, you know? <laughs> but I, I consider it critical. Okay. You'll be next. Hi, I'm Michelle, and I'm a 17 here at Dartmouth. And recently, I've been reading a lot more about how outside terrorist organizations like the ISIS have been playing um, bigger roles in Syria. So how much of a role are these outside organizations actually playing in the Syrian civil war? Yeah, it's a great question, uh, young lady, because as we look at what our options are to try to end this fighting, you have to look at the opposition because Assad has killed too many of his people to stay in. So as you look at the opposition, you find organizations like you just highlighted there. In this case, uh, there are dozens of organizations, but the two most effective are radical uh, jihadist anti-American. That, that is a reality, and one of them is the one that you just mentioned. So it's, a, it's operant, and we're going to have to deal with what is a very complex situation. There's ways to deal with it, but you certainly would want to be very, very careful about who you arm. You know, when I hear about arming the opposition, you, you don't want to give weapons to people that you're going to regret. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Thanks. Good question. So there was a young man up there with the, who had his hand up before, and uh, you can go first. So I, I was just going to ask uh, how you feel Israel's going to react as Iran gets closer to... Having, uh, having the bomb. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Israel will act in her own best interest. Uh, to be more direct, uh, they will do what they have to do to survive. And I believe that that will involve whatever it takes to prevent Iran from getting the bomb. I, I take them at their word when the prime minister says they won't tolerate it. I think someone has the mic already. Uh, yeah. So, as you mentioned, that India and Pakistan need to work together for stability in Afghanistan. So, I was just wondering that how legitimate do you think Pakistan's claims are, based like on the Indian involvement, increased influence in Afghanistan, and the claims that India has been funding violence in parts of Pakistan? And secondly, like how legitimate those claims are? And secondly, what role can the United States play in that? Say that last part again. Like, right. what role can the United States play in that? Like, as the two countries, like, debate about the influence they have in Afghanistan, and, like, we both countries have doubts about, like, the military involvement, the, 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 sorry, with, uh, how they're funding the violence, like, Pakistan claims, like, India is involved in that. So what kind of a role can U.S. play in terms of, like, resolving those issues? What, and what, is, what do you think of the role in Pakistan, and yeah. what role can the U.S. play? Um. The, the reason I, I'm, I'm struggling for a minute here is there's a public role and a private role that India's played, okay? Uh, the public role is heavily, uh, it, it's aid and that sort of thing. But I would be much more comfortable if India moved its consulates instead of Jalalabad and Kandahar, perhaps to Herat and mazar sharif okay? You see what I'm driving at? Because I think no matter what India is doing, because of the location of a diplomatic outpost, they may be seen as fomenting insurrection in Pakistan's backyard. I don't think India has any interest in doing this right now for reasons that have changed over the last couple of years between uh, Islamabad and New Delhi. But I think that the residue, that the background is such that uh, that that is a that is a sticking point, and does that address your one question? Yes, it does. And 
the second one was like, what role can the United States play? Like, for with Pakistan, you mean? Bringing yes, the two with together. Pakistan and yeah. India with respect to Afghanistan. Yeah. Oh, oh, Pakistan and Afghanistan, not Pakistan and India. Like, what role can the U.S. play in the diplomacy between Pakistan and India with respect to Afghanistan and the influence yeah. in Afghanistan after the forces? Well, let me start by saying one thing I think we can't do. I don't think there's anything the Americans can do about Kashmir. I think until the two countries decide they want to resolve it, I don't think the Americans have some secret solution to what these two countries are facing. I think what we can do, though, is encourage that the glacier and Sir Creek be resolved. So you start with things that can be. Nobody wants to fight on that glacier anymore. They're stuck there, both countries. Sir Creek, I'm convinced both Pakistan and India could solve that one. It's just not that significant to either one. So go, we, I think we could help on those two issues and reducing tensions there, but primarily through uh, anything we can do with the World Trade Organization to open the economic bounds between India and Pakistan. As that concern goes down in Islamabad that there could be another war, I think they would be more willing to be uh, flexible on what's going on in Afghanistan, so long as the Afghan army can keep uh, the, ins the insurgents down and they're not using Afghanistan to attack Pakistan. Best answer I can give you. If you've got better ideas, come see me afterwards, okay? <laughs> A good question. Let's uh, go over to this side. Up there. You better be careful, you may make news. Mm. Spare me. I hope not. Uh, hi, I'm an undergraduate here at Dartmouth, and I've heard a lot, especially in the news, about um, this word um, commitment or credibility, especially in terms of the U.S. strike on Syria. And in general, we've seen that in the recent U.N. speech made by Barack Obama, and as well as the recent foreign policy uh, article, um, that there seems to be a worldwide sentiment that the American quote-unquote empire seems to be pulling back. Um, from your perspective, what is the world's view on American credibility and commitment, and how are some ways that we can perhaps um, push back against such a notion? Yeah, I, I think there is a lot more question today uh, about our level of commitment to engagement around the world. I think that uh, what the discussion about the Syria uh, engagement uh, down in uh, the Congress uh, obviously brought it out in the public sphere in an even more blunt way, perhaps. But I think that one thing is we better all talk about staying engaged. That would be one thing. We better remain engaged would be a second. But the third thing, and most important, I think, is to get America's economy uh, on a true recovery. Because right now we're on a fiscally unsustainable path in America. That's a reality. And if, and history is very unkind to nations as far as their military strength if they don't keep their economic house in order. So I think the most important thing for those of you going into business, that you keep an ethical, innovative way of doing business in the world so that we become competitive in all aspects of industry. And that, as much as anything else, will keep our education strong, that'll keep our military strong, but you can't do this just by saying we're going to build more battleships. Uh, that is not the answer to, the, to this question that's being bandied about right now. Actually, can I, let me ask a follow-on because it's a very important question about commitment and credibility. Um, <clears throat> you said you had some very positive remarks, uh, encouraging remarks about our allies um, and partners standing with us. And yet, mm -hmm. if you look at our traditional uh, allies in Europe, uh, they <clears throat> continue to cut defense spending uh, almost annually, and it's way below the targets that they set for themselves through, through NATO. Um, America has always uh, managed to uh, do a good job or do a job uh, advancing its interests around the world because we had lots of partners who shared those interests, but it seems harder and harder to uh, imagine a lot of those countries standing with us. Does that <coughs> give you pause? Is that something that you worry about as we go forward? You know, if you look back through history and what FDR did to coalesce the United Nations against fascism, or if you look at, at what John F. Kennedy did, or if you look what Ronald Reagan did, or you look at what, what happened when you had to bring people together, uh, there was a 
very well articulated threat. And the kind of enemies we're up against today uh, don't lend themselves to that. Further, mass militaries probably aren't the answers. So what we have to do is recognize we no longer defend just a geographic realm. We defend a realm of ideas. And for many of us in this room, they grew out of the Enlightenment. And if those ideas are going to be defended, we're going to have to find nations to share those interests and make a compelling, persuasive argument for it. And if we don't make that argument, then we're going to be more and more alone. But uh, right now, I don't know how well we're able to convey the nobility of what it is we're defending. We have people who are skeptical of it themselves, who are self-conscious about it. Uh, I'll give you an example. We're in downtown Kandahar, and it's just fallen a couple of weeks before, and the old guys come up and say, we want to open the schools. I said, of course. And he said, well, we want to open the girls' schools. I said, absolutely. So out came these girls, boys, all dressed. It was like, it was like we had dehydrated students, and they poured water into a bag and shook it up, and poof, they all popped out. And one day, they took me downtown, they were so proud of it. And here were all these little girls with long white shirts coming out of muddy houses and, and uh, ankle-length skirts and little white socks and everything and little head scarves and, and boys with little backpacks and they're all proudly. And on the street corners are U.S. Marines, U.S. Navy, SEALs, U.S. Army, Special Forces with automatic rifles standing there settling the score and if anybody wants to interrupt the school day, the first day of school. And these little kids, how many of you would have wanted your children walking by foreign soldiers with automatic weapons standing on the streets of Hanover? Pretty disconcerting. And yet somehow those eight-year-old boys and girls have figured out who was the good guys and who was the bad guys. And some of our more literate, more uh, intellectual people had better start figuring out who's the good guys and who's the bad guys as well as, good, as, well as at least the eight-year-old boys and girls in Afghanistan and start representing it because we are now defending not just a realm, a geographic realm, we are defending a realm of ideas, and it is worth defending. Uh, and the, uh, the very unpersuasive spokesman in Washington, D.C., I'm surprised the American people have stuck with this war as long as they have. I'm even more surprised that some other countries have stuck with us uh, as long as they have. But that's all I think about that. Okay. So I don't think people in the middle should be penalized for sitting in the middle. You know, it takes a long time to get the mic to them, right there. And why don't we give the mic right here while the mic is getting over there? Why don't you go ahead? Uh, it's it should be coming your way. Okay. Uh, thank you, General. Um, this is kind of a follow-up to uh, the most recent question, um, but it refers not to allies we're trying to engage with, but to our current NATO allies. Um, earlier this year, I read the book about former General McChrystal um, that was written by the Vanity Fair author uh, who wrote the takedown article, or what became the takedown article <coughs> of General McChrystal in Afghanistan. And a lot of his account about uh, McChrystal and his fellow commanders in Afghanistan uh, talked about their kind of scathing contempt for our NATO allies in Afghanistan um, and how little our European friends were really willing to commit on the battlefield when push came to shove. And I'm somebody who, you know, I like to think I'm pretty idealistic. I would love us to have an effective NATO alliance where our European allies going forward were willing to commit, maybe not as much as we do, because we're a very large country with a very large military, but at least their part. What do you think we, we can do going forward as somebody who's dealt with our so-called allies over the years to maybe get them to engage uh, on the same level, uh, if that's even possible. Thank you. It's absolutely possible, and it's a great question. Uh, let me tell you that Winston Churchill said the only thing harder than fighting with allies is fighting without allies. Uh, and if you read, this is nothing new, if you read uh, Winston Churchill's book on Marlboro, he spends more time dealing with his political problems than he does fighting his enemies. Uh, Eisenhower spent more time seeming to make peace between the French and the British and the Polish and the Americans than fighting Mr. Hitler at times. So this is normal. However, from you young people coming up who have a chance to link with the world, you can never tolerate this sort of arrogance. Uh, as a general, you have to maintain what we call a firing squad. And if I had any officer 
that spoke like you just referred to there, where they denigrate some other unit, uh, I would remove him because he's a bigger asset to the enemy than to us. Um, the, the bottom line is there is room for everyone on the battlefield. My headquarters in Iraq was guarded by Tongans, Tongan Marines. And the Tongan Marine, now were they capable of going out and calling for artillery fire and jets and, and maneuvering against an enemy using tanks? They didn't have tanks. Of course they couldn't. But let me tell you, every time I drove back through their perimeter with their boys laying behind machine guns, and they would very tenderly take our wounded off the, the vehicles. I thank God for those guys. In Kandahar, in December of 2001, when we knew we were going to be attacked and I didn't have enough Marines holding the airfield, the Princess Patricia Light Infantry from Canada showed up and came off. And were it not for Don't Ask, Don't Tell, I'd have been hugging and kissing every one of those boys, okay? <laughs> but my point to you is, you use forces for the level of capability they have. How about when we had our revolution and the French forces gave us a few young generals, Lafayette and others, and the Polish von Steuben and others trained our irregulars, and the regulars, who had a fair amount of contempt at times for the Americans, were the French soldiers. And that's how we fought then. This is the cycle of history, but what we need today from you young people is the willingness to sleep alongside people who dress differently, smell differently, eat differently, talk differently, and to respect them for, for the, the common humanity they have and find the common ground. I, I, let me give you an a real quick example because I love your question here. What, the one night before the Canadians got there, we were going to get hit, so my counterpart was a, a, an Afghan named Galali. If you've read A Bear Went Over the Mountain, he's a 13-year-old boy who's fighting the Russians. He's much older by 2001. And Galali brings his men in to help reinforce my marine perimeter. A young man from Iowa, I talked to him later, was laying behind a light machine gun. And Galali's people come by and they point to one of their guys, point to the hole. An Afghan boy gets in. They don't, they're both about the same age. Neither speaks the other's language. The Afghan boy's got an AK. And they're sitting there and he looks at the Marine, he brings his rifle up and the Marine goes, and he points at the belt and he puts his hands like this. The Afghan kid knows what he's doing, he's got it. So the Marine swings the barrel back and forth and then he points to two cans of ammo, all the ammo he has. And he shows him when that's all gone, he picks up his rifle and he's gonna go to his rifle. The Afghan boy brings his rifle and he puts it up against the stake so after dark he knows where to shoot so it doesn't just shoot wildly. He nods. They both sit back, the Afghan boy picks up the paintbrush and starts dusting off the machine gun links and it's getting dark. And I'm sitting there watching two boys from the opposite side of the earth don't speak their own language and they're gonna spend all night alone in a hole 30 meters on each side from anybody else and who knows what's gonna happen. Now if those two young teenage boys can figure it out, I hope the rest of us can figure out how to work alongside each other and maybe not just in a war but how do you keep from putting 18 year old boys into a war in the first place? Now I'm not into nirvana and I realize we're gonna to have to fight to keep this experiment you and I call America alive. But because we're America and we think we're exceptional, okay, but we're not arrogant, we're not dismissive as others, we should have, it should build even more respect from us for other human beings. So sorry I went on at length there, but I needed to really hit on that. Okay, so you have the mic, and then the gentleman back there after, after you. Okay, uh, can, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I come from a slightly different generation than these, these young men and women. Uh, and when I was in college here, there were enough people in ROTC to fill this room twice over. Yeah. Now we have a dozen. Do, do the military academies provide enough uh, trained leaders to manage our needs or are there, are there needs for more uh, people going through programs like ROTC which supported a great number of people uh, 40 or 50 years ago at <coughs> this institution mm -hmm. but that was uh, interrupted <coughs> by the um, rejection of the, the Vietnam War. Right. Well, you went to the heart of the problem, sir. I just tell you, I don't, as a commander, 
and I didn't go to a military academy, I wouldn't want all of my officers to come out of military academies. I want some of them to come out of that. I want many to come out of liberal arts colleges. Uh, and I, w what you need is a disciplined intellectual approach, but you need an unregimented intellectual approach in the military, especially in today's age, probably always, but especially now, when problems aren't solved by military means alone. The problem is coming out of Vietnam, and I came of age, I joined, I enlisted in the Marine Corps in 1969. Uh, at that point, and I, uh, I won't go into my own political background, but it would not be one uh, that would be found in some of the more conservative circles, to say the least, my family background. Uh, what happened was there was a divorce between liberalism and patriotism, and only in some areas has that divorce been, been mended. If we don't pull more people from the liberal arts schools, if we continue to take a narrower, from a narrower and narrower slice, then we are not living up to the, really the tone of this democracy when it was established, which was a shared sacrifice. And right now, I've got a lot of concerns about it. Matter of fact, one of the reasons I'm going out to Stanford Hoover is I want to study this, this gap and try and figure out what it means. Is it hurtful? Does it exist? I want to, I want to put some thinking to it because I share your concern, but I'm not comfortable and absolutely no, not the, the military academies cannot meet our need. Final. Yes. Um, um, can you talk about or briefly go through all of the factions that are fighting in Syria right now? <laughs> because I know that it's certainly more than just um, people trying to overthrow the Assad regime. Yeah. Uh, on both sides, there are numerous factions. <clears throat> Everything on Assad's side is his own regime forces, or Lebanese Hezbollah, and Iranian Republican Guards. Pretty clean on the Assad side. I cannot go through all of them because there are dozens and dozens on the uh, opposition side. It's very loosely, I wouldn't even call it organized. It's almost incoherent. It's been very challenging to try to get it all tied together. There is some structure that's been given to it, uh, but out of it you've got the very uh, murderous, uh, you know, Al-Qaeda, uh, the one that was brought up earlier uh, coming out of Iraq. There are uh, a number of ones that we do support. Uh, they're, they're relatively ethical. They grew out of the demonstrations. They're, they're fighting Assad's forces. But as the savagery increases in war and that veneer of civilization gets rubbed off, uh, it, it is going to be, I, I, I think there are some very bleak outcomes to face here because when these groups, when, when Assad falls, these groups could very well turn this into another Fatah. There are so many and some of them are so anti, I don't care what you call it, anti-Shia or anti-Sunni or anti-Christian, or anti-West, or anti-Israel, this could be a real witch's brew there. But I can't, I, I, it would take me an hour just to read the names to you. Don't do that. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> we, are, uh, we are running out of time, so what I propose to do is Here's collect the, the, um, the last two questions, two people. This gentleman right here has been sitting patiently. and. Uh, and you're, oh, you're going first, don't worry. We'll collect the last two questions, you can answer them, and then we'll wrap up. All right. General, my name is John Day, former Marine officer, and number of years volunteer at uh, Navy Relief San Onofre, when you were out there at uh, First MEF. Um, I, I uh, watched the Wolf Blitzer uh, uh, interview um, before I came up here, and uh, and that was fascinating, and I find it fascinating to hear you speak. And because I hear a unifying message, a very strong unifying message throughout. And without any specificity, uh, I, I wondered if you plan to stay in the public eye and continue that message in one form or another. No, I, I think it's time, John, that we turn it over to the younger folks. Uh, I'm not shy. I just got back from the Middle East. I was in Budapest last week to speak quietly to all the chiefs of defense of NATO, 
General Dempsey and his counterparts. Uh, I will do things where I can be additive, but I, I have great, great confidence in the young, younger leaders, and they're all young compared to me now, uh, the younger leaders coming up, and I think if I can just pass on the lessons learned, uh, that's really what my role is now, to try to mentor them and not try to live beyond my useful shelf life, uh, so to speak, okay? Okay, so much for collecting them. Here we go. General, good afternoon, and thank you for being with us. Mm -hmm. I'm Jerry Mitchell, class of 51 here at Dartmouth. I spent my junior year abroad in Korea. Uh, I was there when you were born, so uh, <laughs> I would appreciate But in today's world, President Obama has a goal of maintaining world peace. Did you and do the present commanders of the areas have specified, defined goals and objectives, and did your sub-commanders and your various uh, units have goals to achieve that they can be measured by, or are they just floundering around? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Now, the goal of world peace, as you know, has been eluding us for a couple thousand years, but that's not a reason, because the, pa the efforts for world peace means that you stop some of the fights that could have happened. So. I, I stay uh, and, you know, kind of all in on this thing. I believe you can do it. I gave the example of how the anti-mine exercise, the international mine clearing exercise, was a way to just call the or don't do this. But what, what you get is that sort of guidance from above, and then down in my region, what do you do about it? And I mentioned we want to have countries strong enough to arm themselves so we don't have to fight with them, because if you don't have to, if they can defend themselves, nobody wants to take them on. That's another way of deterring. I don't think you're going to achieve it through pacifism or disarm, disarmament. I don't think it's going to work. I have dealt with these guys since 1979. They mean every word they say when they say girls don't go to school, when they say we're going to, we're going to blow up schools and this sort of thing. So I think you have to be pretty pragmatic while you follow that ideal and you try to just keep a balance there where you work with the people who are out for the same goal and make a big enough collaboration that you help checkmate the people who think the proper way to do it is to go around setting off bombs. But you also have to, you also have to make certain your diplomats are supported by uh, people like me. Okay, and on that... Oh, and, and not <laughs> quantified goals. Uh, that, the one with the international mind clearing exercise, all of a sudden they stopped talking. That was a surprisingly quantifiable achievement. But most of what I dealt with was non-quantifiable and subjective in the human domain. I, I liked it when you were stopping on supporting diplomats at the end. But um, <laughs> I, I want to give you a huge hand. Thank you so much for joining us here. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.